Saturn's dead, Saturn was murdered, and he has been replaced. Saint Figurland Garling has been elevated to Gorosei to elder status, and this is also huge for so many reasons, and we have to discuss it. These huge developments might just explain the nature of Imu's powers, the relationship, the hierarchical power relationship between Imu, the Gorosei, the God's Knights, and then the rest of the Celestial Dragons. It clarifies so many things that we have just been speculating up to this point, but of course it also raises so many new questions, and look, we have to go through it all. And we will, but obviously first, make sure to subscribe. It is September, and so if you don't subscribe, you are breaking a sacred sacred tradition. So don't be like Saturn and defy orders. You have been given a YouTube order to subscribe, so do so and then you won't be melted to death. <laughs> okay, in all seriousness, when I was reading chapter 1125, I felt like my head was going to explode. I was reading trying to make sense of what just happened. How, like, what on earth just happened to Saturn? Did Garling seriously just replace him as an Elder Star? And now that I've had time to think about it, I think this actually explains so, so much. We understand, or we can get a glimpse and a better understanding of the Gorosei, of who they are, who Imu is, what role the God's Knights play. Okay, so let's just dive right into it. First of all, I think this seems to really point to the idea and really almost, almost confirms, at least heavily suggests that all the Celestial Dragons, they are just regular human beings. They don't enjoy immortality. They age. They'll die. The Gorosei even, they're not special creatures, they're not special beings, but they're likely celestial dragons that were given their immortality by Imu. Imu has powers and he can bestow immortality on celestial dragons and he can just as easily take it away. We've seen Saint Garling at God Valley and that was set around 40 years ago. He was much younger then, whereas he looks like an old man now, meaning that between the events of God Valley to the present, he didn't enjoy immortality. Like a regular human, he continued to age. Whereas now, now that he has been given elder status, we can safely assume that he's gonna look like this. I don't know, is silver fox the right word? There are some silver foxes in One Piece. Look, Garling, he's got a good fit. Um, but he's gonna, he's gonna stay this age for the rest of his life until Imu eventually takes his immortality away. If Imu does ever take it away. And I think that's how we can understand what basically happened to Saturn. Saturn's immortality, that was taken away by Imu. And as a result of that, it seems like Saturn's body seemed to almost like decompose, like decay and rot away until he was just reduced to bones. Now I'm gonna guess that potentially that has to do with Imu's devil fruit powers, but I guess it could also be something else that needs further thought and discussion. Now we have to mention that as Saturn was dying, we saw these same smoke, the same black flames surrounding him, similar to the flames that we saw when the Gorosei, including Saturn, arrived and were using their transportation ability, their teleportation ability. When they were being summoned to Egghead, we saw these very similar black flames. Not to mention that we've also seen like, you know, black smoke rings surrounding Luchi's awakened Zoan form, as well as all the Gorosei's creature beastly forms that aren't necessarily confirmed to be Zoan devil fruits. And this black smoke ring and the contrast between Luffy's Gear Fifth or even Yamato's awakened Zoan fruit, awakened Zoan form, they have white smoke rings. That still hasn't been justified or that still hasn't been explained in this series yet. It seems like all the antagonists, they have black smoke, while the protagonists, good guys, they have white smoke. And I'm just gonna have to guess that that can be explained that Zoe and Devil Fruits have been confirmed to have a will of their own. And so it seems like once they are within its user, once they have been, you know, consumed by its user, the Devil Fruit must, it must sort of understand the heart, the soul of its user, of its host, and the physical manifestation the physical manifested form that it takes on, you know, takes a bright or a dark color to reflect the, you know, the true nature of its host. Anyways, the Awakened Zoan smoke rings are a little bit off topic, but the Black Flames. It's interesting because we still need to find out how all of these abilities have been transferred from Imu to the Gorosei and Imu to Saturn, for example. It seemed like Saturn in particular had a special ability to summon the rest of the Gorosei. Now, I don't know if it works the same way, like could the Gorosei 
Marseille have summoned Saturn from Egghead to meet them at Marijoie, but it seemed like from the dialogue, the Gorose couldn't summon themselves onto Egghead. They said, you know, you have to summon us here. So does that mean Imu gave Saturn just the particular powers? Look, it just really makes for an interesting question as to what Imu's powers actually are. You know, does he have immortality powers on top of teleportation powers? Is that by way of a devil fruit? But until we actually find out, you know, more clues, more hints as to how Imu's abilities work. Let's go back to the fact that we have now been able to deduce that the elders seem like they were in fact people, they were human, that were given immortality alongside their elder status. Now then, in chapter 1125, it further seems like these Gorosei, they might not have been the original elder stars. They may not be people who were around since the void century like Imu seems to be. Because now we know, we have physically seen for ourselves, the Gorosei are replaceable. And although Saturn is the first person or is the first Gorosei we've seen, we've witnessed this happening to, it's not outlandish to speculate that a replacement of a Gorosei member has happened in the past. I think it would be hardly controversial to suggest, to speculate that Saint Jupiter, he's probably Probably an example of an elder star who was most recently appointed. You know, after Garling introduced himself as a fellow elder star to the rest of the Gorosei, Oda chose to focus on Jupiter. Jupiter with sweat beads. He's stressing. He's shocked. I'm gonna guess that that's probably because he was remembering the circumstances of what happened to his predecessor, the former elder star that he himself replaced. You know, I think it was a reminder to all the Gorosei that any one of you can be replaced so you have to step it up. It was also Jupiter in chapter 1037 at the, towards the end of the Wano arc. He was the one that referred to the world government in third person when they were talking about Luffy's true Nika devil fruit form. The fact that Luffy's devil fruit, its name had been kept hidden, kept secret throughout the centuries. And I think back then, even back then, that sounded off a lot of, you know, alarm bells for a lot of people, including myself. Because it seemed to suggest that these Gorosei weren't necessarily the original Gorosei from the Void Century, the Gorosei who understood and who knew what Luffy's Devil Fruit powers were, the Gorosei who actually were the ones to lie and shroud Luffy's Devil Fruit in mystery. The conversation between him and Warcury back then, it sounded like Warcury was saying, you know, given the length of time that has passed throughout the centuries, that Devil Fruit, that Nika Devil Fruit is a mere legend even to us. And those are the key words, even to us. I would say that it wouldn't be surprising if Warcury, he might be one of the original elders, because it's as if he's saying, you know, even to us to refer to those who have actually witnessed the Nika Devil Fruit already in action. Whereas Jupiter is someone who is responding just saying, you know, the world government has chosen to change its name. It's as if Jupiter has only heard about this story. He's only learned about this fact. It's a second person perspective, not first hand experience, not first hand witness. He wasn't part of the group that decided to change its name. But then someone told me, someone told me that in Japan, it is actually pretty common to refer to yourself in third person. And so that dialogue dialogue might not have actually been suggestive or implying the fact that Jupiter is suggesting that he wasn't a part of the original world government, he wasn't a part of the Gorosei. Whereas now, with these developments, I think we can pretty fairly assume that the Elder Stars, at least some of the Elder Stars, they've changed throughout the series, or throughout the centuries, sorry. They've changed throughout the centuries. It's very interesting about what that says about Jupiter in that case, because out of everyone else compared to the rest of them, he's the only one that was appointed at a relatively young age. You know, he was given his immortality status at a fairly young age, meaning that he must have somehow excelled, he must have proven himself at a very young age, or maybe in the history of the Gorosei, in the history of the world government, there must have been a very tumultuous time where, you know, some people needed to be evicted, some people needed to be fired, they needed to be killed, basically. And they didn't have people with the level of experience that all these other Gorosei members have. You know, Garling, he was the supreme commander of the God's Knights. He was given that level of authority. He was seen as reliable and trustworthy. He had to go through all of these ranks before he became one of the Gorosei. Whereas Jupiter, I mean, it really makes you wonder what's very special about you. What made you become appointed at such a young age? Now, in chapter 1125, we also see a flashback 
back to 200 years ago when Saturn makes the decision to keep Emmett against orders and even then you could argue i think that might suggest that even saturn may have been a replacement for another one of the elders it seems like back then it seems like in this scene that saturn didn't really know all that much about the iron giant for me anyways it comes off across that saturn wasn't around during the void century to have witnessed emmett alongside joy boy to really understand his powers understand his nature and that's why he decided to keep it for himself and that's why he decided to keep studying it. Now, I might be wrong because, you know, the flashback is very brief, but if that is the case, then it's interesting because Saturn himself may have once replaced another Elder Star. His predecessor might have, you know, experienced the same death, that same gnarly death that he did, which I find very interesting. Whereas the decision for Saturn to have actually continued studying Emmett, I think that actually makes a lot of sense given Saturn's role or previous role as the warrior god of science and defense. But now this makes me question, or now this makes me at least wonder about Saint Garling's aptitude, his fitness for the role. I mean, what sort of criteria do people have to go through and what criteria does Imu consider when he decides on who to make the new Elder Star. You know, when it comes to this role, the Elder Star of Science and Defense, I think Garling becoming the head of defense can be pretty easily explainable. He was the supreme commander of the God's Knights, and as we also witnessed during the God Valley flashback, Garling is... He's quite a skilled combatant. So the fact that he would be, you know, the god, the warrior god of defense, that makes sense. But how about science? You know, what makes him fit for the role of science? Is he also interested in technology? It's not something that you know, has been suggested that he does have a keen understanding of science and of technology. But I think this also raises a question about how all the other Gorosei, how they were appointed. Does Imu just assign them different portfolios a little bit, you know, haphazardly, a little randomly? Which if he does, I mean, look, wouldn't be out of the question. We see that happen a lot in our real world. We see people in parliament and in government just get allocated to random portfolios all the time. So... Maybe none of the Gorosei necessarily have like a prior understanding or prior experience in the areas that they're designated. And I guess the question then becomes, does that mean they were all just the best of the best when it comes to combat? You know, were they all previously supreme commanders of the God's Knights? Is that the power hierarchy? Like, is that the authority line that the Gorosei follow? Is the qualifying criteria to becoming a Gorosei simply that you have to be a extremely skilled supreme Super combatant. Another question surrounding Garling's appointment to the Elder Star role is how exactly did he get promoted? Because we don't see this for ourselves. We just see Garling come up and say, yeah, yeah, I'm the new Elder Star. We don't see Imu telling Garling. We don't see anyone telling Garling directly. It also raises another question. Does this mean that all of the God's Knights are aware of Imu's existence? And if so, who else is aware? If not, at what point do they become aware? You know, is it only the Supreme Commander of the God's Knight that is aware of Imu's existence? Previously, I would have to say that obviously the Gorosei were aware of Imu's existence, but that was the very small pool of people who were aware. It seemed like Sabo was one of the only people outside of the Elder Stars that became aware of Imu's existence. It seemed like the rest of the Celestial Dragons for example, aren't aware. Because that's really the whole point about the empty throne, right? The fact that there shouldn't be just one king. There's not allowed to be just one ruler. And yet, you know, the world government are breaking their own rules. They're breaking their own principles by worshipping by serving Imu, just this one being. And Garling, who seems to have a very, like a totalitarian and a messed up value system and a messed up view of things, but he is a very strong-willed, very principled man. That's why he judged Mjolnir the way that he did, based on his firm principles. And so as the supreme commander of the God's Knights, he was aware the world government have been lying all this time, that they're lying even to the Celestial Dragon. And I think this also raises a question about, you know, who else knows? Do the admirals know? Do other people within the marines know? Does at least the fleet admiral know? Because now, not just concerning Imu, but it does actually seem like most of the admirals, at least the very higher ups within the marines, they seem to know a lot more about the history of the world and about the history of the void century than I would have previously thought. I would have thought that the marines, all of the marines, including the fleet admirals, the admirals, I would have 
have thought that they were all oblivious to what happened in the void century. Whereas now, I feel like that might not be the case. You know, we see Sakazuki and Sengoku during Vegapunk's message. And in chapter 1116, for example, both of them are stressed. They're stressed that Vegapunk is telling the truth to the world. And they look stressed more than they look surprised. I mean, I guess you could argue that they were stressed because they know that their jobs are going to become even more difficult now. But I don't know, when I was reading that chapter and when I was reading those reactions, I really got that distinct feeling that if what Vegapunk was saying was news to them, if it was complete news that they had never heard before, even if they were stressed because of the implications about this all getting out, I still feel like their expressions also would have shown some surprise and some, you know, some shock. Whereas I feel like that wasn't the case. Actually, um, sorry, I just also remembered, I just realized there was another person in the garden with Imu. So there are a lot more people that know of Imu than we would have, you know, previously remembered, previously realized, I should say. And I think back then I didn't realize what a big deal that was that there is just a you know seemingly another commoner who knows of Imu so it seems like Imu might have their own personal assistant and I wonder you know how many people really know of Imu's existence you know is there a whole serving staff is there a whole host of you know assistant type staff like admin workers maids and whatnot that know of Imu's existence where do they sit in the hierarchy if you are Imu's personal assistant how much power do you have as a person? Do you have the power to order the Gorosei around, for example? I mean, probably unlikely. At this point, I'm gonna say that the power hierarchy, the relationship seems to be Imu, Gorosei, Supreme Commander of the God's Knights, the God's Knights, and then the rest of the Celestial Dragons. But still, it does raise a question of exactly how many people actually know of Imu's existence. Anyways, Garling's new appointment, now this also raises yet another question. This question being, what is his beast form going to be? Especially because based on what we've seen of Garling himself, we've seen him wield a sword, we've seen him, you know, we've seen him even use a sword, but there hasn't been anything to suggest that he has has a Zoan ability or that he even has any sort of devil fruit ability and I think that goes for all the elder stars I think now the popular assumption popular speculation is that all the beast forms of all the Gorosei are somehow linked to Imu and not like a devil fruit they have personally but now that Garling has taken on Saturn's role what does that mean about his beast form? Is Garling just going to take on and is he just going to adopt that Yuki beast form? Or, you know, is he going to get his own creature, his own yokai form, his own beast form? I think if we see him with the Yuki form himself, I think that would really almost confirm that the beast forms of all the Gorosei, they don't have control over that. That really is something that Imu just bestows upon them. But I would have to say personally, I would like to see Garling with his own, with another yokai form. I feel like he should get a yokai form that allows him to continue sword fighting, similar to the yokai form that Venus Juro has, because they're both swordsmen. And Venus Juro is still able to use his sword and is still able to sword fight while he's in his beast form. I think that would be a real shame if we don't get to see the same with Garling, seeing as, you know, he's been pretty hyped up. And look, I'm no expert when it comes to yokai, so if you have any ideas on what potential yokai form that might be suitable, that might fit Garling, let me know in the comments below. I do have to say, when it comes to design, I think it was really clever it was super clever of Oda to have continually or predominantly have drawn Garling from his side profile in the past so that, you know, his face would look and his hair, the shape of his hair would take the shape of a crescent moon. But now, now that he's one of the Gorosei, now that he's one of the Elder Stars, we see him front on, we see him directly facing forward and now his hair takes the shape of a diamond, of a star. That is genius. Now he's an elder star. Because I guess that's how Oda is working on that star theme that runs through the Gorosei. Because it is obviously very noticeable and it's very noteworthy that Saint Figurland Garling doesn't have the planetary theme within his name like all of the other Gorosei do. You know, we had Saint Saturn, we've got Venus, Juro, Jupiter, you know, all of the rest of them. We don't have that for Figurland Garling, or at least to the best of my knowledge, there is 
no planet that matches Vigalant Garling. If I'm wrong, definitely let me know, please do. But his name itself doesn't seem to have planetary or any sort of celestial theme. Instead, I think he's supposed to represent sort of the moon within the solar system. And I wonder whether the fact that Garling is representative of the moon because of his hair shape, I wonder whether that's going to be somehow influential or significant within the story. You know, for example, because the moon isn't actually one of the planets, but it's a satellite that circles the Earth, and if Imu is supposed to represent the Earth, and that's a whole other speculation, that's its own theory, a pretty popular theory, one that I myself have discussed before. If you haven't heard of it, I'll post the link below so you can understand why people think that Imu might represent the Earth, but going off that speculation, if Imu is supposed to represent the Earth, does that mean as the moon, will Garling be the one that is closest to Imu? You know, is he going to be the figure that is most relied upon, the most trusted? Is he going to hold the most amount of power within the Gorosei? And if Garling actually does end up, you know, holding like a senior authority position within the Gorosei, that might even make sense because Garling would be the only one out of the Gorosei who weren't present at Egghead when the Gorosei, you know, pretty much failed. Well, maybe not failed because, you know, they still do have the Mother Flame, but, you know, they didn't do a superb job. Or am I just reading way too much into this? I do think that this development does explain something that I have personally wondered about, and that's the question of why was there no Gorosei representation in that double spread of chapter 1121? So in that final double spread, where all the key players that are going to be important in the final saga, there was no inclusion of the Gorosei, which I did think was slightly odd because surely as one of the, you know, powerhouses, as one of the most critical authority figures of the world government, surely they will continue to be critical for the final saga. And back then, I just thought, you know, maybe they're all represented by Imu, who is present. Whereas now, I actually do think that Oda, he was still representing the Gorosei in that double spread. He was just doing it on the sly. But now you have to question, what does that mean about the God's Knights then? Because as a faction that was introduced quite late into the series, but built up to be very relevant, very important. Surely they will also play an important role and surely they also have to be represented in that final double spread. So does that mean that Garling is supposed to represent both the Gorosei and the God's Knights? Is Oda just killing two birds with one stone? Or is that mysterious sword-wielding figure, the silhouette that we didn't really get to quite see, is that supposed to be the new God's Knight representative? Because if that's the case, I guess we'll see a revival of the Shanks brother, Shanks twin speculations. Anyway, something about Saturn's death and about all of these developments that I think need further discussing is the nature of Saturn's death itself. So I did mention earlier about Saturn's decision to keep the Iron Giant. Now we also see that Saturn called this decision very ironic, but he didn't know just how ironic this really is. Because the irony goes deeper and deeper, there's layers to this. I mentioned before that the Gorosei killing Vegapunk, or Kizaru killing Vegapunk really, but on Gorosei's orders, it was as a result of Vegapunk's death. It was a result of the Gorosei's orders of Kizaru physically killing Vegapunk that Vegapunk's announcement was broadcasted to the rest of the world. And we see that Saturn calls this main major announcement a major blunder. Well, we now have a second major blunder, the fact that technology, something that he chose to keep, something that he chose to retain for scientific research purposes, this technology, this ancient iron giant awoke and helped Luffy escape and that just happens to be the reason why Imu zapped him. Imu zapped Saturn because Saturn failed to thwart the escape and thwart the plans of the reincarnation of Joy Boy. Because I'd have to say that this battle at Egghead Island, that was a fight that Luffy and his crew probably had no way of winning. I don't think they would have been able to win against all five of the undying Gorosei, an admiral, a slew of vice admirals, you know, CP0 agents. I mean, yes, the Elbuff Giants did arrive as reinforcements, but we actually saw a vice admiral pretty easily deal with a giant when vice admiral 
Doll knocked one of the giants out. So I'm not quite convinced that any of the Elbafian giants would be quite on par with Kizuru, let alone the Gorosei. So I'm gonna say that I don't think the giants themselves were enough to completely even out the playing field. So I think, you know, taking care of Vegapunk, killing him, and then taking care of the Straw Hats, that probably would have been a job well done for the Gorosei if it wasn't for just one wrinkle. That wrinkle being Saturn failing to obey orders and not listening to those orders to destroy Emmett, which again, eventually led to that iron robot, that iron giant, to be the key for the Straw Hat survival when Emmett unleashed that massive amount of Joy Boy's Haki. And this was you know, the most powerful Haki, strong enough to knock out even some Vice Admirals, sent four of the Gorosei back to Marijua, you know, breaking whatever teleportation powers that were summoning were keeping them at Egghead. You know, it cut the Gorosei, it cut the world government's chances of victory. It went from almost guaranteed to now the Straw Hats only having to escape one of the Gorosei and they pretty much checked out depressed admiral and we also saw how imu trembled at joy boy's haki this ever almighty character that stands on top of the rest of the world when we see such a reaction from imu that says everything about how much imu fears joy boy so to allow the continuation of a second coming of that man to allow him to escape that's a major no-no but then on top of that i told you this had layers on top of all of this, remember that Emmett was the host for the Transponder Snail, which allowed Vegapunk's message to be broadcasted all over the world. And so when you think about that, you'd also have to say that this failure to destroy Emmett, his failure to obey orders, that even contributed to that first major blunder, which Saturn did say was allowing Vegapunk's message to be broadcasted. So even that, that was Saturn's fault. So it seems like as strong as he appeared, as strong and ruthless he appeared, and how formidable he seemed, especially towards the beginning when he kept reviving, he kept regenerating, Saturn sucked. He kind of sucked at his job. And now that he's served his purpose in the story, while it might not have been as satisfactory as seeing one of the protagonists, as seeing Luffy or Bonnie or Kuma get to just punch and punish and destroy this old man, I think there is a lot of satisfaction and I think there is a lot of poetic irony in how Saturn's death was handled. I saw someone point out a line from Bink Sake. In that song, there's a line that says, doesn't matter who you are, someday you'll just be bones. And I think that is so apt. I think that is so fitting. Even the Gorosei, even these immortal men, undying, unharmable, regenerating men, they can be reduced to bones. That's what happened to Saturn. What a poetic finish. I do, however, have questions as to what this now means for Blackbeard's future plans. Because if you remember, Katarina Devon and Venogur, they changed their objectives and they left Egghead, being satisfied with themselves about getting to touch Saturn. And they said, you know, mission accomplished, even though that didn't seem to be necessarily their original mission. Now that Saturn's dead, you do have to wonder, does this mean Blackbeard's plans are now foiled? Or does it actually mean that it's going to work even better for them? And look, I do actually have a whole Blackbeard-centered discussion that I have been wanting to discuss. I've been wanting to talk about it. And ever since this chapter, it does change things a little bit. But I am very keen to discuss Blackbeard with you all and his future plans with you all. So make sure to watch out. That video is coming soon. And I am sick and I am straining myself so we might have to cut it there but thank you as always for listening to you know some of my craziest ramblings I hope today was a bit coherent like I said I'm a bit sick so my head's not all quite there but I really wanted to discuss everything about Imu and the Gorosei and Garling and if I've missed anything do let me know if there are further details that I've missed if there's something that I should be paying attention to do let me know I'd love to read all of your comments otherwise I'll see you in the next video to make sure that we do get to see each other in the next video please do subscribe like and share this video if you are a patreon or a member of this channel i love and thank you dearly thank you to all of these lovely channel and patreon members you too can become a channel or patreon member but just remember that subscription that's mandatory because it is september anyways i will see you all very very soon this is joy girl and i'll see you again soon how many times have i said that how many times did i say i'll see you again soon okay bye